welcome to the greatest movie ever podcast. I'm your host, Definition. Um, each month I'm joined by a guest to discuss their favourite film in all its silver screen cinematic scope. As this is our first episode, I wanted to cover a film that I absolutely adore, which is The Shining. But before we get into that, I'd like to introduce a man I've known for several years. He's written blogs for Unilad, Don't Flop. Um, just hundreds and hundreds of sites that he's helped to really grow and push. It's a man who I pretty much see post something Shining related once a week. He's a huge fan and it's great to have him on the show. So how are you doing, Bent Legs? Hi, mate. You're right. I'm good. Cheers, mate. That's a glowing, uh, a glowing introduction. I wasn't expecting anything that nice. Well, I didn't want to talk about the drug addiction, you know what I mean. But <laughs> uh, yeah, the, this is a good way to start. Um, so yeah. obviously you're a massive fan of The Shining um, yeah. Do you remember when you first saw it? No. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of I, one of those movies that that sort of ingrained in the the public consciousness. I think. Yeah, I think the first time I watched it, I was probably a kid, like yeah. teenager, and I just kind of thought, well, that wasn't. I I don't know. Like at that time, I was really big on films like The Evil Dead. Yeah. And like that splattery kind of thing and Mm because the shining didn't really have that at that time i kind of dismissed it yeah Yeah. so i don't remember the first time i watched it i remember re-watching it as i got a little bit older maybe like 18 19 20 right yeah see i watched it at 11 um and i remember absolutely shitting myself i think that was like the last nightmare that i had Uh, i just vividly remember like being in bed terrified uh, of the ending of it (laughs) Uh, but it is interesting that you kind of didn't like it because The Shining did get really bad reviews um, yeah. when it came out. I mean, Kubrick obsessed over doing different versions of this film. Like Tom Cruise used to joke that Kubrick was still editing The Shining uh, in between takes on <laughs> Eyes Wide Shut. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do remember being really scared. It, it was an embarrassing age to be to be scared at, and. You know, it just it really stuck with me, um, and I think the more you delve into it, it, the more you kind of become obsessed over it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely what it was like for me. Like the first time I watched it, I think I watched it with like like a few of my friends. Like we always used to like hang out on weekends, and we used to yeah. just watch watch all these mad films and B movies and stuff like that. Because I was watching it with like a group of people, mm-hmm. I wasn't really absorbing it and taking it in. Yeah. It's not strange because it has got this like very hypnotic atmosphere to it. I mean, I was watching it the other day, um, and it just kind of sucks you in. I think it's like the long shots. Um, yeah. Have you seen the the two different versions of the film? I've seen the American one years yeah. ago, mm-hmm. and I I know that we mentioned it like the other week, and I just haven't been able to find the yeah. extend, extended version of it. I remember the only thing I remember really is that it's about. Is it like 15, 20 minutes longer? If that, I mean, it, it's very few extra shots. Um, uh, yeah, and it's like a few bits that just kind of... I think he said it himself, like he's basically dumbing it down for the American audience. Yeah, there's a lot more kind of explaining. They go more into the, the red rum sort of thing, and there's a. it definitely confirms that there's ghosts in the hotel, like the, the, the yeah. scene where there's these um, skeletons. and. Oh, it's, it's that's the skeletons, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's really it's... not very good. And it's strange because normally I always prefer the longer version of films, um, bar maybe... Leon the Professional and this um, I yeah. just think it works better when it's condensed to two hours horrors in general I kind of think two hours is like the maximum they can go to yeah. because you kind of lose these scares a bit they they can go too far into it as well yeah exactly because yeah. what I like about The Shining is that there's no definites yeah so 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 there's no definite ending like there's there's loads of different theories and the reason it's so good and so debatable is because all of these theories you can fit them in yeah exactly uh, and I've, I've just been going over some of the theories i mean um, rob ager does an absolutely fantastic one um his his youtube channel is pretty much full of just amazing shining um reviews and analysis and it's yeah just, it's really really good so definitely check also, that out because yeah, i've, I've seen stole most of his stuff for this for my notes <laughs> yeah i've seen his one the um 
I can't remember what it's called, but it's about Danny and the the bear costume. Yeah, it's a, I've I've got quite a few notes on that. Um, it's about like the child abuse of the, the yeah. old motif. It's it's quite dark, but we'll we'll get yeah. into that later. Did you know originally that this film was shot square? Um, yes. For TV, and then it's been and Kubrick was kind of he was angry about that, and he didn't want people cutting his movie. Um, so he he made a widescreen version as well. And that's why the Blu-ray version's very... It is it is cutting elements off, but it it's, it doesn't have the black bars along the top that you often get with cinematic Blu-rays. Um, and it, there's a whole controversy behind like just the way that Kubrick shot everything. So when he went to film it, um, it, everything's very much within a tight square because he knew that people would cut it to a square. Um, yeah, but it just it it really adds to the claustrophobia, the the feeling that everything's sort of centered around the middle. He did um, that a lot with loads of films, didn't he? Yeah, he had like that. I can't remember the name of the word for the perspective where everything's kind of like from the letterbox. corners. Might be, um, I don't know. No, I no, think it's letterbox, not letterbox. Is letterbox is normal, isn't it? Crap. Yeah, it's a. Uh, there's like a word for the perspective where it's yeah. basically like a cuboid going in. So like the four corners meet. They all go towards the middle, and in the middle is where it happens. So, like, yeah. if you look through any of his films, I think yeah. bar, bar probably Spartacus, I don't think it features too much in. But especially, like, there's definitely loads of it in 2001, Across mm-hmm. the Gorge, where it all points towards the middle. Yeah. And it gives you, it's like, it's almost like a tunnel vision. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Which I quite like, and I think that it, it lends itself to The Shining really well, because, like you say, that claustrophobia, like, even now when I watch it, there's certain things that make me feel a bit confused or weird about, yeah. and I can't quite pinpoint what it is. So so did you ever read the book? I tried, do you know what? I tried reading it Yeah. years ago. I might try reading it again now, and it was so different. And what I didn't like about it was... It's basically everything that the film isn't. Yeah, there's um, huge differences. Um, I mean, Kubrick pretty much took the plot and then <laughs> did it. And then did what version. he wanted. Yeah, I know that. I know that Stephen King didn't like it because, yeah. like, I know that there's the, the main difference is is like in the book, the evil comes from like outside. Yeah. So there's like outside influences, the house itself and whatever, and then. Like the the film, Kubrick's made the evil come from like Jack. Yeah, and I I think Jack's character, if I remember correctly, Jack's character in the book was a lot more. Um, I don't know. If sympathetic is the right word. The yeah. word that I'm looking for, but his character was a lot less, a lot warmer. Yeah, like he wasn't not, just a psychopath, which yeah, pretty he, he much wasn't. Jack Nicholson yeah. just comes across like that from the beginning. From the very beginning, yeah. yeah. And I, I know that the ending of the book's different because in the book, the ending is in the hotel blow up or catch fire. Yeah, something like that. Whereas um, in the film, obviously, the hotel freezes. Yeah. So, so like, I like that he's kind of gone. Well, do you know what? Yeah, your ending's all right, but I'm just going to do a new one with what I think. <laughs> yeah. And not tell anyone what it means. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Well, King slammed Kubrick's version, um, and he actually made his own. And they, they did oh, have wow. a lot of shots back and forth. Like, the King version is absolutely terrible. Um, if you've I seen remember. That. Was it a straight-to-TV? Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it, it's been shown on Channel 5 several times. Yeah, I saw it. I, it was It was blasphemous to be honest yeah. even though like really it's not because that's what king wanted yeah well, K- well king was actually um contracted to write a film script um but kubrick wasn't contracted to film it so kubrick pretty much threw out king's draft and brought in what he called an actual serious novelist <laughs> um to write his script with him so yeah, they kind of had a falling out over the years. King has recently admitted that he does like The Shining, but I think that's just people <laughs> years and years yeah. being worn down to it. But on it's the surface, st- it is a really just a simplistic plot. I mean, a man goes to a hotel, he gets cabin fever, he tries to murder his family, um, he, he's he's an alcoholic, he hit a student, he ruined his career, and he sort of needs this chance to to revive his career and that's why they have to stay in the hotel but everything just sort of goes haywire 
Um, but it's a brilliant like setting for a horror movie, and I, I can't yeah. really remember anything before this. I mean, would you ever go to the Overlook Hotel? I'd love to go. You know what I'd the weird thing go. is? They um, there isn't actually a room two three seven at the Overlook Hotel because they thought no. that it would scare people off. Yeah, it's it's like two one seven. Yeah, in the it's two one seven. Yeah. Yeah, but apparently, like, because I but think. But I don't see what like surely more people would want to go if they had a room two three seven. Yeah, well, apparently the two, the room two one seven is the most requested room in that yeah. hotel. Because mm-hmm. it's not it's not called the Overlook, is it? It's called I can't remember what it's called. It's called something else. Yeah. But um, yeah, like I like I yeah I'd stay in room. I've got a room. I've, well, I haven't got a room. I've got a two three seven tattoo. Oh great! Yeah, yeah so I've, I've got like, yeah, I've got the axe, and yeah. then the blood coming off it, it. The blood spells like two, three, seven. Oh, brilliant! Coming off it. Well, that kind of goes into my next point, which is like the legacy um, of The Shining. Like, have you ever watched Hannibal? Yes. There's so many homages in that. I mean, they. I, I watched it quite recently, um, and that's sort of what made me want to do The Shining first. They have like an episode where they rebuilt the bathroom set, um, and what? there's aspects of the the carpet um, appears in American Horror Story. I mean, it's a very yeah. famous carpet pattern. Um, I've got the carpet pattern tattoo as a background. For right. Me. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But I've got the. Um... You know, room two three seven. The carpet is like a yeah. purple. It's like a purple, like half circle, repeating on itself. I've actually yeah. got a hat of that carpet. Oh, right, cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a brand called Casual Connoisseur that they do stuff. It's mainly for like footy lads and stuff, but they have a lot of cultural references. Mm-hmm. And um, they brought out, well, they brought out a few, but they brought out one, the orange one, the orange, you know, the iconic carpet. That, that was in yeah. Toy Story. That carpet as well. Right, you know? Okay. Oh you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. When they go next door to yeah. sit, the carpet's there. It's just like such an iconic carpet, isn't it? Yeah. I, I've noticed it in so many films, and I always like nudge my girlfriend and go, "That's the, that's a carpet from The Shining." Yeah, I'm like that. Um, yeah, I've got um, everything I've got is like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm literally looking at my Xbox now, and I've got a skin for my Xbox on the controller of the carpet. Yeah. Oh, brilliant! And then I've got like a mouse mat. I've got patches. That I've got all sorts of stuff. Like, yeah. I've, everything is shining related but yeah like that carpet um what was i talking about first like cultural references that was yeah it. So, like casual connoisseur released uh, at the hat but they only release like i don't know say like 40 or 50 at a time mm-hmm. and they're like 35 quid it's like a bobble hat that folds up it's got the carpet covers like the carpet colors and everything and then like a, a blue bobble on the top yeah they go on sale. They'll announce when it's going on sale because they've done like I think two or three runs, and they'll be like, "Oh, it's going on sale at one o'clock." Uh, this well, not one o'clock, seven o'clock. Right. One minute, one minute past seven. They're on eBay for 150 quid. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's like, yeah, I, I just cannot get hold of them for loving the money. But like, uh-huh. they released all sorts of stuff. But like, yeah, like the cultural references. That it's in everything. The Shining has been referenced, I think, more than anything I've ever. I don't know whether it's because I've noticed it more because I'm the fan of it. Yeah. So I see things that other people may not see. They might mm-hmm. just think, oh, it's two girls. Do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah. I'm like, well, no, that's that, that's obviously the girls from The Shining, or that's the carpet, or that's the the, the, the kid kind of like riding his bike, whatever, you know, yeah. whatever it is. And yeah, and it, I, I think I first became aware of it when it was parodied in The Simpsons. So I was about to say, I knew yeah. you were going to say The Simpsons then. It's been parodied, parodied a few times in that, I think. I mean, even I, Passengers, um, which came out quite recently, that's got like a similar sort of bartender. Um, oh, and it, and oh, yeah, there's yeah. so many things that just have like the shining within them. It's amazing um, how much it gets used for such a, yeah. for a film that so many people hated at the time. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's great because now so many people obsess over it, and it's because of the work that Kubrick put into it. Um, I, I think like the The Shining holds the record for the most amount of takes of any scene. Yeah, um, the um, is it the going up? It's going up the stairs scene, isn't it? Where she's sw- Wendy's swinging the bat. Well, there's a one um, that was quite a lot, and there's the guy oh he's, he's mind i'm getting a mind blank yeah um the mystic guy who has the shining as well oh halloran yeah he uh he broke down and cried because he had to do 187 takes on something um i, I think the blood elevator 
scene they shot twice and that was the only thing that they did in less than 10 takes um and it's just crazy that that's the thing that they shot the least um, it's mad isn't it it's, yeah. it's, you know I, like i saw a thing like i watched a video on youtube i can't remember which one because there's there's hundreds but there was one and it was about that elevator scene yeah and I didn't notice it until it got pointed out. Have you noticed, like, you know when the blood kind of comes in and it mm-hmm. kind of splashes, it's all in slow motion. On the left-hand side, as we look at it, there's what looks like a body bag drops with it. Right, okay. Like, no. in, the, in the blood. Yeah. And, like, I, I don't know what that is, whether, like, that's what they've used. They've used a bag or something to store the blood or something yeah. to let it drop, or that's what moved so it could drop in. But it's like it looks like a body bag in the blood. It's so weird. Yeah. I didn't know, I didn't notice it until like it got pointed out. That's, that's what crazy, I like yeah. about the film. There's so many things that I'm like, right, that's what it is. That's yeah. why to make. That's why it doesn't make sense. You know, when something doesn't make sense and then it gets explained and you're like, oh shit. Yeah. Well, one of the the big things that doesn't make sense about the film is the layout of the hotel. Yeah. Um, um, they try to re- recreate the the layout of it in a Duke Nukem level. Um, yes. Like a mod. And, and they couldn't do it, could they? Yeah, they couldn't do it because it's just absolutely like crazy. Like what I love that Kubrick does is he gives you this feeling that there's something wrong within the hotel, but you can't put your finger on it. Because it's so subtle as well. There's no yeah. explanation to so many things. Like one of the things I like most is, you know, that big room that he's in, like that he sits and does his work in with his typewriter. And yeah. Whatever. So like as he's sit where he sits, he sits opposite the stairs. Yeah. And on the, the right hand side of him, it's like a big window all the way along. And the, the, the room is like really, really tall room. It's enough for two, probably three stories, really. Yeah. But when they go up the stairs on turn right, they can turn right again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Into a corridor that like wouldn't be there. Exist. Because obviously the wind, you, you can see out the window, you know there's nothing there. But also when he's going down there, so he's, he's gone up, he's turned right, he's turned right again. On the right hand side of that corridor, there's doors. Yeah. Like hotel rooms, which essentially if you open them, there'd be, be nothing there. In the middle because, of the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, but like I never even twigged on that the first however many times I watched it. Because mm-hmm. I wasn't. I wasn't watching it that attentively. I was watching it like, oh, this is cool, like whatever, blah, blah. And then I was like, why Why do I find this so strange? Yeah. Like, you know, and the office as well, where he does the interview. Yeah. The There's a window, window behind the manager, um, even though we can clearly see before he walks into it that there's a corridor behind there. Yeah. So it's like, how is this working? Another one that m- like massively stands out is when Jack goes into the red bathroom behind the bar. Yeah, um, the fact that the bar like overlaps the the bathroom cubicles, and it just completely messes with the feeling of space that you have for the the entire like surrounding, and it just makes you really uneasy, but you don't know why. Yeah, it's, and it, I, it's massively I think, built. I can't think of another film where that's been done to that extent, yeah. and they've deliberately done it as well. It's yeah, not because, because like they don't know how to explain something. Like they've like set out to make this just mess with your head. Yeah, and purposely not explain it. So you're kind of watching it and you don't know what's weird about it, but you just know something is, like a subconscious yeah. sort of thing. And you really gotta study the film to kinda of, to see it. Um another thing that you kind of really have to study is all of the reflections that Kubrick yeah. uses throughout objects characters um like the the twin daughters a lot of the environments they're they're perfectly mirror like the the maze um when yeah there's it's... every time a ghost appears there's a mirror at some point yeah. um even when jack's walking towards the gold room he lashes out every time he passes a reflective surface and there's this real focus on mirrors um throughout the entire layout of the hotel and the the symmetry sort of to me it symbolizes that there's there's another layer to everything there's there's a opposite to everything that you're not quite seeing and the same yeah, like, way that there's the almost, yeah the like, life like a dark and the ref- afterlife yeah yeah like a dark reflection exactly sort of yeah. thing. so like because i noticed that when he's walking to the gold room like i that's one that i picked up myself i mean mm-hmm. obviously it's explained on other videos and articles and I was looking at it, and I was like, oh, shit, every time he kind of, he goes mad, it's when he's in front of the mirror, because he, like, takes three steps, does it, three steps, does it, do you know what yeah. I mean? 
and like I picked up on that and then I was like ah oh, okay and then like you say there's mirrors are you because there's symmetry and then there's mirrors and they're kind of used the way they it feels like they're used is to, to oppose each other yeah so like there's like like I say like that dark reflect because I know there's um, a bit with the mirror in the de- the room that they're staying in where it like yeah. He's he's lying on the bed and it's reflected, but it's really une- it's like a really uneasy scene. Yeah, and he's being really weird, like he's not. And you kind of get the feeling that one of those characters isn't there, and that one of them's talking to their reflection or their psyche. Um, well, and it, it's just like the way the characters interact with one another. There's always this uneasy feeling that they might be hallucinating the entire thing. Well, I read that I didn't read it's a lie. I watched a theory recently. Have you seen? Because, like, I had to turn it off in the end because it was just so much nonsense. Have you seen The Shining Code? On no, YouTube? I haven't, no. Right, it's worth a watch because it's funny. But, like, <laughs> he he literally goes, whoever this bloke is, I can't remember his name. He's like, right, okay, so Danny and Jack are two versions of the same person. And right. that is Stanley Kubrick. And Wendy is Stanley Kubrick's wife. Okay. And, then just, yeah. and, then and then he just cuts into the next thing. He doesn't explain like yeah. what he means by that. But I he's like, I've heard that theory that um, Stanley but, Kubrick was going through a divorce at the time. So this film sort of <laughs> is a summation of that. Yeah, it's. I was just like, well, you've not explained like. But he he goes mental in his. It, yeah. it is because some of these theory videos are well funny. It's like yeah. he goes right. Well, in the open anything. Yeah. Yeah, he goes in the opening shot, you know, when you see like that lake and the mountain and the roads on the side, mm-hmm. he goes, oh, well, if you look at the lake, it mirrors the sky. And it's like, well, yeah. well, yeah. yeah. But if you look at the lake, it, it makes an A. And it's right. like, well, no, that's just kind that's of where the lake. <laughs> that's the lake. That's where the valley goes. So he like draws with like Microsoft Paint this A and he goes, oh, that A, that means that the, it's a reflection of there's a big event happening up in the sky that begins with an A. So obviously that's the Apollo moon landing. Right. <laughs> like, that's the, the biggest yeah. reach I've like ever heard. The, the Apollo moon landing theory uh, just kind of never... It's one of the theories that I've just never been able to agree with. Basically, um, the Apollo 11 jumper that Danny wears, they, they kind of get from that that Kubrick film, the Apollo moon landing... Yeah, and it's Which... have you seen the things with the carpet though? It is kind of. It's not yeah. like I'm, I'm not saying that Kubrick filmed the moon landing. Well, you can tell that Kubrick didn't film the moon landing because there was no hidden meaning in the moon landing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly. that's the way you know. There's far too many flaws in the moon landing <laughs> yeah. for it to be shot by Kubrick. Yeah. yeah. But, um, like that bit where he's sitting playing with his toys on the carpet, the way the carpet is set out, it's in like a, um, I don't know what the word is for six-sided shape. Hexagon. Not, the hexagon's five, isn't it? Is that not is a it? pentagon? That's a pentagon. No, pentagon's five, hexagon. Yeah. Always sit. Yeah, we'll call it a hexagon and hope that we're right. But like, <laughs> So like he's sat and he's like playing. He's got his rocket jumper on, I think. And then he's in the middle. And then he's playing with like fire engines and ambulances and stuff. But it, the way it's set out is the same as if you look at a photo of the Apollo like launch. Yeah. yeah. The layout, which I could understand. Like that, that could be intentional. That to me doesn't mean that he filmed the moon landing. No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But like uh, the other thing with the Apollo 11 jumper fits in with. I, don't, I know we said we we're going to come into it later, but it fits into the um, the child abuse. Okay, well, okay, we can talk about yeah. that now. Um, so Let's move on to child abuse. Like, why not? Yeah, get, <laughs> get the subscribers up. Um, so the theory is that the bear at the end, given the blow job, um, symbolizes that. Jack molests Danny. Um, It was a dog originally in the book, but Kubrick deliberately chose a bear. Um, Now, most of the research I got from this was from Rob Ager, um, his his channel, Collative Learning, Collative Learning. What the hell are you still doing here? Go watch his video. It's better than this. (laughs) But um, yeah, definitely check out his video. So yeah, it's amazing. The bear theme throughout really repeats. Danny, at the start of the movie, wakes up next to a teddy pillow yeah. Um, and Rob actually went back and looked at the original catalogue for the teddy and the eyes in that were really round. Mm. But the bare one in the film, the eyes are really crumpled. 
It looks like they've been cut, doesn't it? To yeah, an angle. they look more sinister. And then the Doctor's looking into Danny's eyes, um, which is obviously bringing up the importance of eyes for that scene. Yeah. Jack at the start um, <laughs> with his job interview, he's reading a magazine, um, oh, a Playgirl oh. magazine yeah. about incest um, in front of his boss on the first day in a hotel lobby. Good um, first impression. Why yeah, wouldn't you? Really I mean, good. <laughs> why, why, why wouldn't you read that article in yeah. that situation? But it's like, yeah, because I've seen that and it's from a few years earlier as well. Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's not it's like deliberately it, been chosen. Yeah, it's not like it's the, you know the latest. I mean, why Playgirl would be in a hotel lobby anyway? I don't know, but like, it's obviously been picked and chosen, right? Well, we'll put this in there, and it takes some research to find that out. Yeah, because obviously it's not clear enough on first. Even on Blu-ray, it's not. It's very hard to see. Yeah, but then obviously people have found that cover, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, yeah, incest. Why do parents sleep with their children? I think is the name of the article. Yeah. And the same way we approach Danny when he's leaning over the sink um, is the yeah. same way that we approach the woman in the bath in room 237. Uh, the shower curtain's exactly the same. Um, it's a room that we know Danny got abused in. And Jack thought he was kissing someone in there. Um, during the kiss, when Jack's in 237, Danny's also having a seizure, which kind of alludes to this. Um, when... Wendy comes up to Jack in the bar. She says that there's someone in the room, and, and Jack just replies, "Are oh, you yeah, out of your fucking mind?" Because he knows it's not true. Because he's the one who did the uh, yeah yeah. And then Do you he, think... he goes to basically what Rob said was he goes to sleep, um, and is in his drunkenness he has a nightmare in which he's Danny and he's being abused, and that's why he then returns to see Wendy and Danny like nothing's gone wrong. <laughs> which uh, the first time I saw the film, I remember laughing at that scene because like he's just been through this horrific thing, and then he turns back and like, what, was there anyone there? It's like, no, didn't see a thing. <laughs> which it, it sort of might be, you know, significant to how children kind of cover up um, abuse sometimes, and they just yeah. say nothing's happened. Um, Do you think that like you know that scene with the woman? Yeah. Do you think like the whole dream? theory do you think it was a dream or do you think it happened i think it happened i think it was a ghost um but jack's so intertwined in the hotel that he just denies that it happened yeah because like i i when i first heard about the dream theory i was like right okay because you see danny um he's like shaking yeah and i was like right is danny projecting is he shining now and projecting that into jack's head so that jack sees that Mm mm-hmm do you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, I don't know yeah. now. Do you know what I mean? Because I thought it was a ghost at first. I thought it was part of the hotel. And then he just denies it because he's because he's part of the hotel. Yeah. For, you know, potentially. But like once I once I heard that dream theory, I was like, ah, oh, shit. Right. OK. Yeah. You know, it, and d- then, it does make sense. Definitely as a dream. And then the whole Toby thing as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, t- not Toby. Tony. Sorry. Tony. Like, little Tony Montana, little <laughs> little tiny Tony, his little finger friend. His which little obviously, friend, say hello to my little finger friend. It's, <laughs> little Tony that, Montana. That, that film would have been so different if, <laughs> yeah. if, if the whole film was about <laughs> a, a child's finger that, <laughs> that that comes and sells cocaine in America. Yeah, I think imagine. that should be that. That should be the remake. There's rumors yeah. of a remake. It should be Definitely. little Tony Montana. Yeah. That would be a lot better. But, yeah, like, the whole Tony, like, the imaginary friend thing, like, once I knew about the abuse theory, I was like, right, is Tony Jack's knob? Yeah. Like, is that... Well, it's you know, in his mouth, doesn't it? And yeah, he says it's in his mouth. Doesn't want to talk about it. You can't see him. Yeah. Because he goes in his belly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, it, and there are lots of things there. And, again, with the bear theme... Um, there's there's a picture of bears that hang above Danny's bed, um, and the naked the naked children that mimic the bears. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, is... I mean, there's bears throughout the entire film. There's there's a big bearskin rug in the the main hall, and main hall. Yeah. You've, every time something bad happens, there's a, there's always sort of a bear around. Um, another thing that plays in the background is there's a sticker of dopey. Um, on the side of the bathroom door. I'm so door glad you start. mentioned that. Yeah, after after he gets his vision um, of the hotel at the start, Danny, the, 
for some reason the dopey sticker disappears. Yeah. Which could imply that Danny's no longer dopey to the world. Yeah. And that he knows what's going on now. It, it's the growth of his ability. Um, and it's also symbolized by the fact that he's riding a tricycle on the bottom floor. And then the next time we see him, he's on the next floor, which is where he yeah. seems, sees room two, 237. And he's just constantly elevating himself. Um, and that little sticker symbolizes quite a lot. And you, you can clearly see it against the bathroom door. And then in the next scene, it's gone. Yeah. And that's, you wouldn't, you wouldn't start filming a film and then go, oh, do you know what would make this better? Let's put some Seven Dwarf stickers on the door. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's obviously intentionally done and filmed that way round. Yeah, exactly. Uh... It's it like because that whole like sticker thing, I've mentioned that to like a couple. Like I know a few people who like the film and not quite to the point where they kind of study it. Mm-hmm. But I've mentioned that and then straight away they've gone, oh, OK. Like that's the I think that's the one thing that kind of resonates with a lot of people. They're like, right, he's not a dope anymore. I get it, yeah. but, you know. And um, yeah, like the, the the thing is as well with because you don't see the dopey bit, the dopey sticker. You know when he's talking to the psychiatrist and yeah. he's lying on his bed, the door is next to Wendy, and you can see the bathroom, but you can't see the door with the stickers on. Yeah. So, like, once he's talking about that, it's removed then. Like, even though you can't see it, to mm-hmm. see that it's been taken down, it's actually not in frame. So, yeah. again, like, that's something that I picked up more recently um, when noticing. Because, obviously, like, he's talking about um, Tony and stuff like that. And he's lying there with no pants on, with his hands kind of covering his, his groin area. Yeah. Which, again, really, really does heavily. Yeah, it's quite disturbing. Hint- yeah, hint towards the um, the abuse thing. But going back to the Apollo jumper, that's really, really phallic. Yeah, definitely. And that, Which that's again, I didn't notice symbol. that first time until I started hit like reading and hearing about the uh, the abuse theory. That was when I noticed the the rocket jumper. I was like, well, that looks like a dick, doesn't it? Yeah. Like the the, the you know having an immature mind does kind of come in useful. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. It, when analysing the most complex films of all time, having an immature mind does help sometimes. Yeah, so like, best. yeah, so like he's wearing a jumper, and then it, the jumper changes and it's ripped and his collar's ripped and he's wearing the Apollo one, mm-hmm. and, and it does look like a dick pointing towards his mouth. Yeah. And also when Jack falls over after having his nightmare, like a load of like spit comes out of his mouth. Yeah, which is you can like, take like, that anyway, really. Yeah, like obviously people drool when they sleep, but it's just a bit too much for it to be unintentionally yeah. like a, a sign of something, you know? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, and and going more into the sort of disturbing side of things, um, I love how the ghosts aren't scary in the film; yeah. they just appear as people. Um, but yeah. there's a very very sinister side to them. The, the scares are very, very subtle. There's no real jump scares in it. Um, there's disappearing chairs throughout the film, but they're always in the background, and it just lets you know that there's something wrong. Like this, there's something rumors right. of Kubrick just messing about with the set all the time when they weren't shooting and moving things about, so yeah. that when it does have a cut, you, there's an object will move and you'll not quite pick up on it, but it'll be in your subconscious, and that's what Kubrick does brilliantly. Like yeah. the the two main ghosts in it, the twins, they they sort of have a blue dress, um, and it, it, I'd only noticed it very recently. The shape of their blue dress is the same shape of the seat of Danny's tricycle. So when he's riding that along, if you squint, it also looks like he's wearing a blue dress as well. But also, that's the exact same dress that Wendy is wearing. Okay. You know, when Danny's lying on the bed, yeah, and after he's brushing his teeth, she's wearing a blue dress with yeah. red, like a red um, top underneath, mm-hmm. and Danny's wearing a red jumper with the blue seat to mimic. I don't know whether it's mimicking his mum or the twins or both, or whether him and his mum are this events version of the two twins in the blue dresses. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, because like it, like it's like that mirroring thing again. Because there is um, a sort of feeling of reincarnation throughout the film. Um, yeah. 
Delbert Grady is the the sort of main highlight of this. He he very clearly calls himself Delbert Grady in the bathroom, but at the start he's called Charles Grady by the manager. Yeah. There's a theory of reincarnation which explains how Jack was able to be in the 1921 photo. There's a there's a basically Grady and Jack sort of switch. So one becomes the caretaker when Torrance is like either just died or he's growing up so he's not able to like be a hotel caretaker and they they sort of intertwine with one another and take over each other's roles. Um it also explains how sometimes the twins are twins and sometimes they're different ages. Like the manager at the start clearly says that the twin they're the girls were eight and ten. Yeah. Even though they're definitely twins. Um and it's this nice sort of subversion of expectation. You get told one thing by one character and then the next time when you see them in reality there's there's a difference to them. Um, but it's a subtle thing as well, so it's again creating that confusion while you watch yeah. like hang on, I thought his name was Charles Grade uh Charles Grady, not Delbert. Yeah. But like that that whole like you say, like that reincarnation of Charles becoming Delbert. So is he? Did Delbert go there after Charles did? Is yes. is he related to him? So did he go there and then, or is he just literally a reincarnation as a ghost or or what? But like when I when I first watched it, I didn't pick up on the name changes. Mm-hmm. It was only like a bit later on, and I was like, I'm sure he said his name was Charles Grady. Why have I got Charles? Yeah. And then you know, like, and then there's like like the twins thing. Like he says the twin. He says they're eight and ten. Then you look at them and you're like, I'm sure they're twins. Yeah. And they're always referred to like culturally. As twins, yeah, you know, yeah, like they definitely are. They're, they're the, the twins from The Shining. I don't know in real life if they are, you know. Really? Yeah, okay. because I'm sure I remember seeing. I'm gonna. Should we have a little quick look now? Yeah, have a look. Are the... I'll talk about Delbert Grady and how how polite he is. I love how like tying back to the the sinister side of the ghost. Delbert Grady is really polite, but you can clearly tell there's like something wrong there. I mean, he's cleaning Jack up, and then he's just... He never says he murdered his daughters. He just says, I corrected them. I corrected them, yeah. Yeah, which is which great. Is, and I it, like... when, when he starts suggesting that Jack kill his family, he's like, you've got a very naughty boy, if you don't mind me saying so. Which is quite <laughs> funny. Like he's, He says a couple of times, if you don't mind me saying so. It's a very are... polite way of like scaring someone. They are twins in real life. Right, okay. They are, yeah. They're both, like, 50 now or something. Oh, okay. But, um, yeah, like, the, the Del- I like the uh, the Delbert Grady character when he says, um, you've always been the, the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. Yeah. It's, yeah. like, it's so creepy the way he says it. Like, I think it's because they don't cut away and his expression doesn't really break and he says it with such conviction. Yeah. And it's just... Yeah, it's very, very, like, creepy. But without being, like, an insidious type of movie where yeah. it's just jump scares all the time. And, like, the stuff, like, I've I've read recently about a lot of modern horrors, um, like your Insidious and your, your Conjuring sort of, th- those sort of studios. They use a bass tone that's really, really, really low that you can't, like, hear. You can only feel it. Yeah. So when they want you to feel tense and anxious and nervous about something this bass tone is played so mm-hmm. you can feel it and so you feel dodgy in like your stomach and your chest but you don't know why yeah which is a really clever technique if, if it is true i don't i've never made a film like that, i don't know but i i can imagine that's the sort of technique they would use but what i like about the shining so much compared to those sort of films is the jump scares don't exist and the tension comes from the layout of the of the set the the storyline itself the characters yeah. The, the the little things like the, like old school filmmaking like how do we confuse people without letting them know that they're confused yeah we'll, we'll just change little things subtly but like all of these confusion things they all fit into all these different mad fan theories as well exactly yeah um and it, another one which kind of ties in with albert grady because he drops the end bomb a couple of times yeah is the undercurrent of racism within the film yeah. um jack 
very he- heavily says when he's drinking it's it's the white man's burden. white man's burden yeah yeah i mean there's indian heritage mosaics on hanging walls um indian chants i'm sure you can hear an indian chant during the radio conversation between wendy and the police officer I'm oh sure really like a, oh. yeah oh, it's very subtle but once you notice it it's definitely there um, like the, in- the indian theory is one of the ones i'm most interested in yeah um, well, it, it, this chant sounds like when you collect coins on two rock um, <laughs> it's like very very clear and that's kind of what it reminded me of i'm gonna listen out for that next time yeah. but i like i like the indian theory because i know that they mention at the very beginning when they're talking about the uh, is it the donna family and the cannibalism thing yeah when they're in the car and then they mention that the hotel is on an old indian burial ground yeah and, and then there's obviously like within that, like once I knew about that theory, I was like, "Well, that's bollocks. Why? Why would he do a film about a hotel and a guy killing his family to link it to like Indians?" But I don't think it's obviously a full representation of it. But the, those lines do fit in. There's too much for it to be coincidence. Yeah, well, like the, the Indian stuff everywhere. But then there's like the cultural disrespect, like when he's throwing the ball around the room and he gets really angry and he throws the ball at the um it's like a huge indian mosaic yeah mosaic mural thing on the wall as massive and then what i noticed as well and it took me a long time to pick up on it is the red white and blue thing okay where, where's that like, i haven't actually seen that well he wears red white and blue danny wears red white and blue and wendy right. wears red white and blue obviously confederate colors yeah and when he right walks into the room there are like when he walks into the interview, there's like a little American flag when he's talking to the manager. And yeah, when he kind of goes mad, like as well, what he's what he's wearing, like they're like Danny and Wendy are wearing red, white, and blue quite prominently. You know, mm-hmm. like it's very obvious, like primary colors of bright blue, bright red. Yeah, they're both, they're both primary colors, aren't they? Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I can remember, but then like Jacks are a lot darker. Yeah. So, like, his shirt is, like, a navy with, like, a white check on it, and then his jacket is, like, a, a, a burgundy sort of red. So it's, like, the dark red, white, and blue, so, like, the dark side of America and yeah, stuff like that. And that when he's being violent, and those are the scenes where you kind of can pick up on it a lot more. Yeah, well, the, the, that clearly there's an Indian um, food can yeah, um, it, it almost looks like product placement the way that's just kind of <laughs> placed in the, the shot in the camera. Yeah, um, and the the tagline used for the film on a, on its release was the wave of terror that swept across America. Yeah, which Room Two Three Seven discusses how it symbolizes the genocide of the American Indians. The fadings throughout The Shining are also so long that they create a superimposition. Yeah, there's a bit where right at the start. The, the forest sort of fades into the hotel lobby and I mean it's a three or four second fade and it looks like the janitor's sweeping up the forest yeah which sort of symbolizes like um like uh, cleaning the grounds yeah almost. cleaning the grounds of America um Danny also retraces his steps later in the maze which is supposed to sort of symbolize retracing your history and there's so Wendy throughout the entire film just like dresses in Indian clothes, she's got yeah. a coat that has teepees on, and that um, yeah, and that the tassels, the uh, yeah, friction on it and stuff, yeah. And she just yeah, so I mean the Indian thing to me, it, it's clear as day. Um, another one that sort of ties in with the racism is the Holocaust theory, it, it, which I'm not too sure about. Uh, I'm but, not too sure on that. I, yeah. Uh, in room two three seven, basically, they say that the German typewriter that Jack uses um, symbolizes the typewriter uh, that was used to industrialize the killing of the Jews yeah. um, during the Holocaust. It's got the word Adler on it um, and an eagle, which obviously that that's both things that were used by the Nazis. And there's there's several eagles throughout the film. Um, yeah. In the manager's office on T-shirts. And, you know, th- these are meant to symbolise the government's controlling of killing. Um, and the typewriter actually changes colour throughout the film. I was about film. to say the, ch- the change of colour. Yeah, which sort of... Y- y- you should really be giving attention to it. Um, but, yeah, it's... I'm the, not too sure on it. I think the, no, the Indian I think one kind of... The Indian one, for me, stands out a lot more and makes a lot more sense. Yeah, definitely. 
um, to be that. I like I like quite a few of the, like a few of the theories. Like, which is your favourite theory? Um, probably the Indian one, and it's not really a theory, but just the the hotel layout. Um, yeah. I mean, every scene has an impossibility in it almost. Yeah. Like Danny watches his TV at one point that doesn't have a cord. Yeah. Uh, it's not yeah. plugged in anything. He's just sitting watching TV. Uh, there's, there's another bit where the hotel lobby at the start, the the luggage that the family have brought, it, there's so much of it. It's piled like <laughs> yeah, six it's like foot fi- high. It's like 15 people's worth of yeah, uh, suitcases in it. There's, there's no way they could have got it all in the car. Um, yeah. There's a point where they're getting a tour of the hotel and they go across a road and a car is literally just about to hit them and it cuts and the next shot they're like walking along and the car passes them. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of, the, there's a real dark sense of humour that Kubrick has and, and that's why his films are so fascinating. The the Shining's almost comedic in like a really dark way and a lot of the lines that Jack gets are you know that they, they could be laughed at when, yeah, the, and obviously they were when the simpsons did it um yeah the wendy darling light of my life yeah exactly That's yeah so funny that it makes me laugh now even though i know that i shouldn't laugh at it it's yeah you know he's he's about to try and kill his wife not great but it is quite funny at the same time yeah and do you, do you think that jack has the shining himself no see i do because when Danny and Wendy are in the maze, Jack's just standing and staring out into the garden, and there's the shine sound effect. Mm. Um, and I think that drinking made him lose it. So when he was drunk, getting drunk all the time, he lost his like ability to shine. And then from not drinking, he regains it, and that's why I can start to see ghosts in the hotel room. Um, yeah, I like where... I like the alcohol theory. I like that the whole film being yeah. around. It's a, a what's like a metaphor for his alcoholism. Yeah, and and one of the the main things that I, I think kind of confirms that he has this psychic like, connection with Danny is he's throwing the ball at the wall. Yeah, and then the same ball rolls out of the room at two three seven. So it's kind of like he's beckoning. Danny into this like room psychically, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's I I do take it as he's he's got this power um, as well, and he's passed it on to his son, and the the hotels kind of brought it out in him. That's a so cool. I never I've never thought of it like that because I yeah. always kind of looked at it like now nah, I I always kind of thought like well Jack hasn't got the shining. Yeah, but I've that... changed your mind. Yeah, well, oh this isn't going <laughs> up. I'm going to edit it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm gonna watch it again with that in mind. Yeah, and try and think about that. Any like, excuse to rewatch The Shining, and you're on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, oh, apparently this happens in one scene. There's like a book on the side. All right, I'll watch the whole film again. <laughs> just yeah. Um, yeah, I like the alcoholism theory. That's one of the theories that's quite new to me. Like the because yeah. there's obviously there's there's mentions of him um, being a recovering alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when he mentions, like, oh, I'd give my, my goddamn soul for a glass of beer. Yeah. And the white man's bird, that's in the same scene as the white man's bird. And, yeah. And, 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 that. and that's when he meets um, Delbert as well. Exactly, yeah. And that's when things for him start to get more and more confusing. Yeah. And it's, it's a great film. Um, and, is there anything that else you want to talk about? I mean, I do have notes on the the Gollywog doll with the the blood red shirt, um, being similar to Halloran, how he's murdered, but nothing that really jumps out at me. Um, um I don't know. I mean, I kind of want to cover. It's all sorts. Like, do, what do you know about the labyrinthian theory as well? No, no. What's that? So basically, like the hotel, like in I know in the book there was no maze, it was yeah. just the hotel and there's no maze. There's big garden, hedge dogs and yeah, yeah, yeah hedge was animals. No, that was terrible in the remake. There was no actual maze and stuff. And like one of the theories is that it's basically leading towards the the well, that's the labyrinth. Right. And okay. That Jack is the Minotaur. Okay. And, 
it's like it's it links in with like the whole film being like a cycle of death so it's like just death repeating death repeating death repeating yeah i can't remember the name of the guy in greek mythology that defeats the minotaur um it was either theseus or perseus i think it might have been theseus i think it might have been theseus if only there was a way we could find out instantly (laughs) um so i'll let you google that but while yeah so like it's it's basically saying that Jack um, is the Minotaur. Yeah. Danny is. We'll go with Theseus, who mm. defeats the Minotaur. By, it is Theseus. Is I it, got Theseus? it right? Yes. Nice one. <laughs> so like, but by doing that, he breaks the cycle of death. Okay. Um, I also like the isolation. The isolation part of it, like the the solid, like the solitude of hell and whatever, because like. At the beginning, when Jack's having his uh, meeting with the manager and he mentions um, about the isolation and being lonely and stuff, mm-hmm. he, what does he say? I can't remember. I've got notes because I've written down the exact thing he says. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it now. But he basically says that he's okay with it. Yeah. And and in my head, I'm like, right, is he okay with it because he's fine? with the isolation because he wants to try and get himself back on track. He wants to ride. He, he wants some time and pit space by himself. Or is he okay with it because he knows what he's going there to do? Yeah. And the, the isolation allows him to do that to because do he it, knows yeah. no one's going to be able to interfere because no one can get there. Yeah. And like people are at their worst when they're isolated. So a hundred percent. Yeah. So, well, yeah, and no as well in that because obviously it brings out the worst in him. Mm-hmm. But also, yeah. it brings out the best in Wendy and Danny. So all the all the bad things happen in that film when people are on their own. Yeah, true. So true. so so like Jack goes into room two three seven. Something bad happens. He's there by himself. Danny comes down. He's as far as we're aware by himself. And all these different things that happen because people are there by themselves. But with Danny and Wendy, it's the opposite. So like isolation brings out the best in them because like yeah, Wendy yeah. becomes like brave and quick thinking, you know, chucking Danny through the window, taking him on with a knife, whatever it, locking him when she locks him in the, um, in the kitchen, in that room in the kitchen, she locks the door and locks him in. Yeah. Yeah. All these quick thinking things. And then Danny's obviously brave when he runs away from Jack and he retraces his, his own steps to hide, to confuse him. Like that's quick thinking, but he's always, it's always when they're by themselves that they do that. Yeah. Uh, that's true. That's a correct. Yeah. And I quite like that. Um, it's not even a theory; it's just that aspect of it is like the, the the isolation aspect. I really like. No, that's a really good thing. I'd never even thought of that before. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about, or? Um. I know you've probably got loads and loads you want to say. I've got all sorts of stuff, but it's like. Do you have any problems with the film? No, because the things that I thought were problems. I like that they're there because they make me think about certain things. Yeah. I I have a couple of them. Um, I think there's a couple of big time jumps that where you, you're basically getting a tour of the hotel and then it jumps ahead um, a bit, which I know obviously Kubrick probably wanted to do, but just looking at it from more of a conventional movie point of view, um, there's a bit where Halloran's talking with Danny about The Shining and then literally just jumps. Um, one of one of the funny things I think about it is that Jack Nicholson is pretty much always called Jack in all of his <laughs> movies. And I'm, I've never known why. Um, it, it reminds me a bit of Keith Chegwin when he did a, a, that sketch in Extras. And he, had, he had to be called uh, Keith. Keith, yeah. Uh, yeah, some, like, sometimes Nicholson acting is a bit over the top. Um, and like we've, we've discussed, there's a there's a great comedic edge to it, but yeah. you know he does a really good job. The the here's Johnny scene is just phenomenal. Like it's it's so famous as well, and um, just because of his performance, it, it's so well done. Um, and I, I I love when he just has little smirks throughout the film, and he looks at the camera sometimes. But that there's... bit where he looks at the camera really freaks me out. Yeah, like he when knows he... you're there watching him. Yeah, like he argues with Wendy and then he walks out, doesn't he, out of the room. Yeah. And he like glances, but his face is so like aggressive. Yeah. It's like the slightest glance of the camera. The camera 
incidentally is what would be pretty much in Danny's bedroom's doorway. Yeah. It would have to be. And he like glances. So is he looking at us or is he looking at Danny? And I, it's so angry and so subtle because I didn't even notice it the first couple of times. And then afterwards, I was like, he well looked at the camera then. I'm yeah, sure. he's definitely did. I, But like, that's obviously intentional as well because Jack Nicholson, you know. Wouldn't look at the camera. It, let, you know, in the most simplest terms, he's not a shit actor, is he? Yeah. You know I mean? So he would know. You don't have to tell Jack Nicholson, don't look at the camera. Yeah. Kubrick wouldn't stand for someone looking at it so it's obviously intentional and for a reason and is he letting you know that he knows you're watching yeah is he angry at us is he angry at danny is he do you know what i mean and there's all these different like every little thing could have so many meanings and possibilities no 100 percent. i tell you who i do think was a shit actor um shelly duval uh, i really don't like her in this film no one um, does yeah she pretty much did nothing after this or play olive oil in Popeye, <laughs> um, and I think Kubrick just broke her down. Yeah, she uh, um, struggled. She had like a lot of. Um, I think she took a lot of time out after the film because I know what I do like. It sounds really cruel, but what I do like is that as the film goes on, her performance gets more and more drained because obviously. Yeah. The, that happens to the character, but also because it literally happened to her, and you yeah. can you can literally see it in her face. She literally cannot be fucking asked anymore with what's going on. Yeah, and that kind of ties into the film so well. You know, like how like the actual look of fear on her face. Yeah, when well, Jack's was... smashing through the door and she stood behind it and that. And then when he's like trying to come up the stairs and she's swinging the bat because they would like take 170 or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And she just looks so exhausted. And like, I, I agree. Like, it, yeah. I, I don't particularly like her in that film. But I don't think the film would be the same with a different actress. Yeah, no, I get, I totally get that. Um, and another it, person who had all the takes was Scott Manker, others, obviously. Um, I, I kind of don't like how he plays the the cliched mystical black guy. Um, I can't remember. That was meant to be given to somebody else first. Yeah, but it's it just was. like a, a thing in horror movies where you've always got the mystical black person. And I, I do kind of think it's a bit cliched. Um, but, you know, Scat Man Carruthers, he did get the Guinness Book of World Records um, for the most takes ever, which, just looking it up, uh, it was 148 takes for the scene where he talks to Danny in the kitchen. Wow. So, yeah, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking down. Uh, Tony's also a bit of a non-entity. Um, I kind of think yeah. it should come full circle almost. It just kind of you know, it's... Up, it? It, yeah. but I, I like that in that it kind of gets fitted in, like it gets swept under the carpet. So if that's a representation of the child abuse, yeah, they're kind of sweeping it under the carpet. So it's like a... It kind of mirrors that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, but, I do agree. Like, obviously, I love the movie, and the the things I'm nitpicking are more from a sort of conventional movie goer point of view. Like, I've got one friend who thinks this is the worst movie ever made. Yeah, and me. We yeah, argue and I'm just so like, much. just watch it, just watch it, please. <laughs> How do you think it ended? What do you think the ending is? What it means? I really don't know, to be honest. Um, I, I do kind of like the just the horrifying frozen corpse. Um, but I really don't know. In the book, Danny escapes, um, and he he graduates, and then sees Tony off in the distance, and he realizes that Tony's an older version of himself. Right. Okay. Does something like that. But what what do you think of the ending? I think, um, these days I'm leaning towards the absorption absorption. I can't even say the word absorption theory. So basically, so Jack gets absorbed in the hotel. Yeah. yeah. So he, what, he's not been there before. He's okay. it's like the reincarnation of people keep going there and getting sucked in. So like he goes and that's why that photo from 1921 I think it is. That's yeah. why it's in that photo because yeah. he's been sucked into the hotel and he's become part of it. And he's I like that forever. Yeah, like the I like the the fact he doesn't technically die, he just freezes. Yeah. yeah. So it's like the whole frozen in time. And yeah, then yeah, that, that's really good. I, I like that, and I like the um, the repetition within the film. So, like the all work and no play repetition, it's just the same thing over and over and over again, with a few little bits where it goes a bit wonky, but it's the same mm-hmm. thing. 
which reflects the the, the, the you know the overlap the overlapping theme of the whole film is a repetition yeah where, you know definitely. people before him have gone there done the exact same thing yeah no. and I, that's that's what i like to think it is at the minute you know, ask me in six months when I've watched it. <laughs> it's totally different. Theory. Another fifty times, I'll be like, "Oh no, it's definitely the moon landing." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. Definitely. Like he says it because he's got the Apollo jumper on. How can it mean anything else? Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah. that's what I'm lying with at the minute is that he gets sucked into the hotel. Yeah, and I think I kind of do agree with that a bit. Although the reincarnation thing as well, I don't know. There's so much. There's so much going on. But that's uh, what I like about it is that all of them fit. Yeah, and so they all work really on, well. Yeah, you, you can, can make five-hour videos discussing every single point, probably. Yeah, like that guy does. Yeah, <laughs> he loves it. Yeah. Uh, but thanks very much for checking out the first episode um, of Greatest Movie Ever. Uh, Bent Legs, do you want to shout out any of your projects or Twitter? Um, just at Bent Legs on everything, pretty okay. much. Um, no ongoing projects that I want to shout out because none of them are close enough to be finished and I'll probably end up dropping them halfway through so that'd be pointless yeah so yeah <laughs> I'd like to shout out my granddad um, William Bruce who sadly passed away at the weekend um, he had a really beautiful death and I'm, I'm really lucky to have had him in my life and the family um, greatly miss him so yeah thanks for all the great years you gave us we've kind of been trying to record this podcast uh quite a few times but something's always came up yeah and i'm glad that we finally got got it done <laughs> we've had fun doing this um thanks everyone for taking time to to listen to the episode as well anything you want to say bent legs before we go uh cheers mate yeah, cheers <laughs> to you as well i'll have another one it's the white man's burden <laughs>